you probably thought I was done with Aristotle. You probably thought I had had enough of Thomas Aquinas. Well, it's never enough, okay? It's never enough! <sighs> Am I a little bit manic? I won't say no. But listen, you guys ask me these incredible questions and you expect me to just stay calm? What do you take me for? I can't possibly remain calm when we're talking about the grand theory of translation developed between Aristotle in the ancient world and Thomas Aquinas in the medieval world, which is also, by and large, my theory, not just of translation, but kind of of everything. This is also sort of my metaphysics, although there are versions of it that work better for thinking about language and versions of it that work better for thinking about physics and other stuff. But I think this, I would call it a tripartite symbolic theory of the world, makes sense out of a whole lot of stuff. And I think a lot of people in the modern era have sort of rediscovered it. I've mentioned Chuck Pierce. Obviously, I talk all the time about quantum physics. If you're just joining us for the very first time, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. This is Young Heretics, the classical education that you didn't know you were missing. And on Fridays, we talk about translation. Words, Words, Words is our Friday series where I take questions about how language works and how the transition between different languages work. And last week, I asked I got asked by Blaine, a listener, to just go ahead and pony up and put down in one episode what I think translation is and how the soul communicates its inward experience out to the world. And I said, I'll do it in one episode and then I'll say more in the second episode. So this is it. We're here in the second part. But just to recap, basically what I think about words and language is based on Aristotle's De Interpretatione, where he says that the world is symbolic, meaning that it consists of symbola, which is a Greek word, coming from the words meaning throw together. So the world is full of tendencies or patterns. When you have this thing, then you have that thing. Where you have a fire, the fire produces smoke. And if the tendencies are natural, they happen every time. 100% of the time works every time. You can always count on uh, ice to freeze or fire to burn. There are certain symbola in that most basic sense, that is certain correlations that are actually tightly linked to one another and are always there. And one such symbolon is the pathema of the soul, the pathema ente psuche, which is a homoioma. So lots of Greek words and they're all delicious. But the pathema is the thing that your soul experiences or undergoes when it encounters a thing out there in the world, or what a Latin writer might call an agent, something that does something to you. And this is this fundamental two-part idea between acting and being acted upon, poien and paskein. And when you paskein, when you have an experience, when something acts on you, then in your soul there arises a pathema. And that pathema, which is just the noun form meaning the experience, is a little image or a picture or a likeness, a homoioma, of the thing outside of you. So when I hear birdsong, there's something going on outside called birdsong, a certain form or pattern in the vibrations of the air that is acting upon my soul via my ears through my aesthetic sense of hearing, that is my physical sense of perception of hearing, and I'm taking in that form like an imprint on the wax of my soul, okay? That's the pathema. And Aristotle says that the pathema is a symbolon of the thing out in the world, which is the same everywhere for everybody, which means that it's a natural symbol. It always arises just the same way that whenever you touch a hot stove, your hand gets burned. Whenever you encounter uh, an object in the world, it produces a pathema in you. This is natural. The world is naturally symbolic, which is something that sounds very unscientific, but actually makes perfect sense. If you think of nature as a system of correlated events, one thing happens after the next, it is true. It is really true about the world that any time a consciousness, a human mind, meets with an object out there in the world, it you can't help but experience a pathema, be acted upon through your senses. That's just what it means that you have senses, that you have eyes that work. That's step one. 
Step two, after that natural process, which is real and hard-coded into the world, you can respond with a symbolon of your own creation or of our collective social creation. That is, you can throw together the natural symbol that has arisen in you of the outside world with an arbitrary or a conventional symbol that you have imposed called language. And that's ta en te phone. So there are symbola that are pathemata in te psuche. There are experiences in your soul, in your mind, in your consciousness, that are, are symbols of a reality outside of you. And then you can use your voice and also writing and also gestures or whatever as symbols of the symbols. That is, you can symbolize your experience. But the difference is these are not natural in the sense that they don't automatically arise. They are natural to humans in that humans will always do this basically wherever they are, but it's not spontaneous and automatic in the way that the pathema, the experience of the soul, is. Aristotle basically lays this all out. As, as I said last week, he just tweets it out. It's a far-reaching, an utterly profound theory of language and of the world. It took a while to chisel out from Plato to Aristotle and actually before them from Socrates and so on. And then says Aristotle, but I've talked about this whole likenesses of the world in the soul thing in my book on the soul, in de anima, as we call it now, or perites psyches, as they called it in Greek. And when Aristotle says something like that, those of us who are really into Aristotle always feel like, gee, Ari, where's that? <laughs> but unfortunately, they hadn't invented the footnote yet, so often you have to go away and find it yourself. Luckily, there have been some advances in scholarly technology in the many hundreds of years since Aristotle wrote and existed, and many people have gone away and said, what, what is he talking about when he says, I refer to this already? Well, in De Anima, which is Aristotle's treatise on the soul, he talks a lot about the actual, I would call it a mechanism, the process by which this experience, this pathema, this inward perception of the world outside of you arises in the soul. That is always and everywhere, no matter when or where a human soul encounters a certain entity, be it a table or a chair or bird song or a piano or whatever, whenever you make contact with it, this thing arises in your soul. And there's lots of places actually in Dayanima where he talks about it, but I want to raise with you one particular one because it will be especially helpful to get a handle on how all of this works. And this is Dayanima 417a. These are Becker pages named after the major edition by Becker that laid all of these things out by pages. And so any edition that you have of Aristotle, if it's worth the salt, will include the Becker pages no matter what actual page the passage is on. You can always look to these Becker pages. De Anima 417a. And here Aristotle says that we talk about per perceiving in two different ways. To eis thenesthai legamon dichos. This is called the problem of homonymy, according to fancy philosophical terminology. And it means whenever you notice that people in casual speech will use one and the same word for two distinct phenomena, or you want to draw a distinction. And so Aristotle says, legomon dichos, when we say this word to perceive, we say it in two different senses. In one sense, we say that that which has the power to see or hear has perceptive faculties and even if it happens to be asleep. So if, if you're asleep, you, you're a perceptive being. You can still perceive even though you have sight, even when your eyes are closed. But then also there's the asthesis, the, the perception that is actually happening in energeia, that is in activity. And I talked a little bit about this last week, but I'm going to get back to it now because it can be a little bit confusing and Aristotle lays it out here well. He's saying there's the dunamis, there's the potentiality of seeing, even when you're asleep and even when you're not active. And then there is the activity of seeing even when you're awake. And all of your senses are like this. And this is one reason why we don't just kill people when they're in a coma, because they're not currently conscious, but they are the kind of thing that can be conscious. They have that potentiality, that possibility. And he, Aristotle goes on to say that the things which are perceptible also have this twofold nature. There are things that are that can be perceived, and then there are things that are perceived. So this is last week when I was talking about the tree that falls in the forest. If nobody's there to hear it, 
it makes a sound in the first sense, in the sense of creating the conditions or the potentiality for sound. But since it doesn't land in that symbolon, in that pathema or inward experience of somebody that hears it, it's not being perceived in energeia, in actuality. And that crucial distinction is sort of where Aristotle is going to start here. So we're going to return to this again, and I want to pivot away from the tree example and just give you another one to give you a sense of how deeply the world is actually symbolic, that is communicative according to the laws of nature, not according to my pet theory about metaphysics, but actually according to just the way things work. Put your hand on a hot stove. The stove burns your hand, right? Ouch, why did you do that? <laughs> if I told you to jump off a bridge, would you do that? Okay, don't answer that, but let's just imagine. Don't actually put your hand on a hot stove, but put your imagine that you put your hand on a hot stove. It burns, right? It's hot. We say, when, when the stove is burning, we can say burning in two different ways. Dikos, as Aristotle would say. We say that the stove is burning even when nothing is on it. No pots, no pans, no hands, nothing. Still burning. But that's not quite the same thing we mean when we say that the stove is burning your hand. When you are having the sensation of burning, there's actually an active burning going on. And Aristotle points out that the burning isn't in your hand. Your hand hasn't caused the burning because if that were true, your hand would always be on fire. It would be the source of fire or a fire itself. And in fact, Aristotle says that if your hand or the burned thing were the source of the burning, it would be no different in effect than if it actually were fire. In, in teleotea, in the effects that it produces, it would just be the same as fire. So your hand is not doing the burning, but the burning, the actual burning, when we say burning in the energetic sense, the active sense, it can't happen without your hand being on there. So in a certain sense, your hand causes the stove to be burning in a different way. Once you put your hand on the stove, it's burning in a different way than it was just burning on an open flame. Open flame with nothing on it is burning as a dunamis, has the, the burning potential, and that's why we say it's burning. But hand, stove with your hand on it has the activity, the energeia of, of burning, okay? So apply that to all perception. The conditions for perception are always joined to the cause of perception. That is, if we think of the tree as the cause of the sound, it's a natural and automatic process for the falling tree to create always, every time it falls, the conditions for the sound to happen. The world comes in symbols. But the activity of the pathema, the actuality of that symbol and of the perception and of the reality is brought into being by your being there in the forest to hear, or by your placing your hand on the stove. So in one sense, yeah, the world exists outside of us. It is the way it is, whether we're there or not. In another very real sense, we change it by being there from mere potentiality into activity. And if you've heard me talk about quantum physics, and if you've heard me talk about why I wrote my book, Light of the Mind, Light of the World, you will start to get a sense for how important this is, because Aristotle wouldn't have known this, but it turns out this reality goes down, right down to the granules of existence. It's not that they are any way we want them to be. We can't magic them into position or cause them to be just by thinking about them or change the world through changing our minds, but the way that they are outside of our perception is a matter of pure potential, possibilities and likelihoods, which is what quantum wave functions describe. When you observe the particle, then they resolve into an actuality. So they move, as Aristotle would say, from dunamis to energeia. And Werner Heisenberg, one of the architects of quantum mathematics, actually made almost exactly this comparison. But if you want to read about that, you have to buy my book, which you should do. It's linked in the show notes, Light of the Mind, Light of the World. It comes out October 15th. Let's stick for now to perception and language, right? In the world, there are these potential symbols. Just like particles in quantum superposition, there are potential sounds, sights, and realities. And so the idea which came up in the modern era that there's no such thing as perception or color or quantity or anything without human experience, not quite right. There is, it's just in potential. It's unresolved until you are there to receive it. That is, in my opinion, not quoting Aristotle here, that is the consummation of 
nature. That is where, where the chain of the symbolic world meets its final point. After that, ball's in our court. After that, we have the ability to impose our own symbols. Now, why should we want to do that? Why would we want to do that? Well, because we are made also to be in relationship. And when the minute that voluntary choice of the will enters into the world, the potential for love enters in. Because you, you can't say except by a kind of analogy that stones fall out of love for the ground. And people used to talk about this in this way, and there is a certain sense that this is true, and you can read Dante's Divine Comedy if you want a beautiful picture of the world as motivated by a form of love, and before that Empedocles talked this way and earlier Greek philosophers, but we think of love in its active true sense as something chosen, something voluntary, and at least that's a heightened version of what happens through the world. Dante says that there is a love that moves the sun and other stars, that courses through the universe and causes the laws of nature to work, and that love then ratchets up when conscious entities with free choice of the will enter in. And so we are given this enormous task, charge, privilege, responsibility of taking this created world that communicates to us and reflecting it to one another. Since, yes, the experiences we have are in some sense universal in that they always happen everywhere human souls encounter the world, but they also have each one their own unique stamp and personhood. And this is where individuality begins to enter in, because when I describe the world to you, I'm using these symbola that we've created, these tokens, to convey to you what the same world looks like to me, what kind of pathemata it's making on me. And there's overlap, but there's also difference, and this is part of the beauty, part of what I called last week the exponential multiplication factor that ramifies the world into a thousand thousand points of love. This is all incalculably, be incalculably beautiful. It, it <laughs> overwhelms me with joy and delight. It's also, of course, the potential for sin, right? It's where the opportunity for falsehood opens up and enters in. And this is why we are the inflection point of the universe, for good and for ill. And I think the Bible represents us this way. I think if you think about these things long and hard enough, you will realize we are this way. Even if you are a rank evolutionist, you have to sort of think of us this way. Marx kind of thought of us this way. So this is not something that is just me thumping my Bible. Marx also wrote about the transition from history into mankind and the determ the self-determination that not that man was not purely material, but that at a certain point matter becomes self-aware and starts to direct its own course of action or has an input in its own course of action. Marx talks about this too. Whatever you want to cite for evidence of this, it's sort of plain that we are this entry point for nature into spirit. And this is why the next guy to cite and to talk about and getting a grip on this and a handle on it is my boy Thomas Aquinas. So the relationship between Aquinas and Aristotle is very, very tight. You probably have heard me talk about it in some form or another. But again, just to recap, Thomas Aquinas calls Aristotle the philosopher. And his project, or ma major part of his project, is to demonstrate that Aristotelian physics and metaphysics can be pressed into service for Christ, can be baptized, can be understood in a way that confirms or at least doesn't totally fall apart in the light of Christ and Revelation. And he does this monumental work to make that happen. But one place where he's a little bit slept on, he's not as much appreciated, is not in the Summa Theologiae, which is his grand work, but in his book De Natura Verbi Intellectus. And this is his book about the inward word, that is, what's language and what is this thing that we have inside of us, this pathema in, within us, that we represent or communicate or convey using language and using logic. And here again, I said last week, I hate to be that guy, but I got to be that guy. You, you have to really go to the Latin here to kind of grasp what he is talking about. So let's get a little stuck in. I just want to pick out some portions here from chapter one, where he's talking about the 
thing that happens inside the soul when we perceive. And he's drawing on De Anima, and he's drawing on De Interpretatione, although he's not, in this particular passage, he's not citing Aristotle directly. All that having been said, he writes effectively that the objects of our perception are formed in the soul itself, in ops, ipsa anima formator. So here he's talking about those pathemata psuches, those, those inward experiences of the soul. He says objects of this kind are in the soul. And this is important because in the Latin he's saying objectum, object. In English, we think of objects now as dead things, but this is a product of the scientific revolution that draws this hard dividing line between things out there and experiences in here. But the whole point of thinking afresh in this ancient way is to see that there's actually a chain of causation that leads from the things out there into the things in here, and that the end of that chain is an object that arises within us. Yes, there are objects out there, but part of their nature and part of their real structure is to make an impression on us that arises within the soul. And this objectum, in ipsa anima formator, is formed within the soul itself et non extra and not outside. Since it's not outside, how do we get it across? How do we say anything? How do we talk? Well, now, he says, says Aquinas, the object that has been formed in the soul is in anima ut in subjecto. It is in the soul as in a subject. So the object becomes, in some sense, subjective, which is beautiful. And the Latin words here are somewhat more active, but it effect effectively becomes subordinated or sub within the soul. It becomes kind of grasped within the soul. In anima ut in subjecto. And the soul becomes the subject of this knowledge. So the object itself becomes a source of or an object of subjective knowledge and the objective becomes or translates into the subjective and it is a similitudo rei extra. This is almost a direct translation of Aristotle. He doesn't say that but it basically is just like what Aristotle says about the homoyomata of the things outside. That the pathemata inside the soul are homoyomata. This is the Latin version. It is the similitudo, the similar, the, the likeness or the similarity of the thing outside. But because, quote, autum est in anima, because it is in the soul as in a subject, it is formed as a habit. What on earth does that mean? Well, again, the Latin is habitus. We think of habits as our reflexive ticks, of course, but a habitus is a much larger thing, something like the posture of the soul. It's related both in Greek and in Latin to the verb to have. And so this is something that gets incorporated into the soul. And again, Aristotle talks about the outside world pressing in on us like a ring pressing in on wax. And he says we get the form of the outside thing without the matter, just as the wax receives an impression on a ring without the gold or the iron or the silver. And he's thinking here of signet rings. So like in Game of Thrones or all those old timey looking fantasy TV shows, they always take that ring and it's got a design etched into it. And to impress the seal of their identity onto the message, they take a pool of wax and they stamp it in. And Aristotle says perception is like that. And that's basically what Aquinas is saying here too, that you stamp the ring into the wax. The wax takes on all the shape, but it doesn't take on any of the gold. And the, the, the original form, the object itself, remains with the same etchings in it, even as the soul takes in this impression unto itself and can now play with it, can experiment on it, can think about it, can eventually say words about it. But the ring remains outside. This, by the way, is exactly the same idea that Jesus has in mind when he talks about whose image is on this coin. When he says Caesar has this coin, it belongs to him because he's got his face on it. It's that same idea of the metal impressing onto a, an, an object, or in this case, it would be the, the uh, mold of the coin impressing onto the metal of the coin, and then the coin takes on the form, but not the matter of the seal. Form without matter is the nature of perception, and the original remains outside and still has the nature that caused it to make that impression on you, but the impression is now in you as a kind of habit. That is, it is shaping your soul. It is a shape within your soul. But, Aquinas goes on, de perfecta autem ratione habitus est. So the habit, a habit of the soul, 
is of a perfect account, is, is of a, 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 reaches a kind of perfect formation when it is joined, conjungitor, to an action. Now, unless you had been spending time with me and old Aristotle, you wouldn't notice the connection here between the joining of the action to the habit and the symbol, the symbolon, that joins our experiences to the outside world and then our words to our experiences. But now you do. So you see what's going on here that Aquinas is saying habits are potentialities in us when they have been kind of recorded in the soul. So once we've had this experience, the memory sort of sets it down. And the more we have experiences of the world, the more the nature of the thing starts to impress itself upon us, the form of it without its matter. And it's the action that we perform or the way that it affects us that finally completes that habit. Just as my habit of smoking is brought to its consummation if I have a cigar at a certain time once a month, just as my habit of a good backhand is confirmed and reaffirmed by my doing backhands in a tennis game, so this soul habit that I take on through perceiving must find its outlet ultimately in some kind of action or reaction. For in this, says Aquinas, its nature is, I would say, completed, but the word is perficitor, it's, com it's perfected. In this, its nature is perfected. But it is perfected per lumen naturale intellectus, the, through a natural light of the intellect, which wraps it up in Walwen's specium intelligibilem, in an intelligible species, in quo et sub quo intelligator. So this action, which is not yet external, it's not yet my speaking the word, is my soul subsuming, is the technical philosophical term, but like taking in like an amoeba, like it's sucking in these individual perceptions gradually over time as the habit accumulates into a form, into a species like dog or chair. And you're starting to see here how closely this looks like the moment in Genesis when God invites Adam to name the animals. I said before that that was not a moment when Adam was just making up the Hebrew language. It was something much different from that. It was taking these things that he had made that have the inherent potential to affect a human consciousness and inviting Adam to apply the seal of consciousness to him. And you know how I know that? Because he doesn't just take one animal to Adam. He takes them each after their kinds, it says in Genesis. So what he's doing is inviting Adam to organize perceptions and to organize the perceptions that arise naturally out of the outside world to organize those under the natural light of his intellect which is the categorizations and the forms of logic that we apply to the world that's the inner light of the word the word is the imprint or the template under which you gather all of your different perceptions. And once that's happened, as that happens, you begin to be able to apply your symbols to it. And right language making is just using words that reflect arbitrarily, if you like, by convention, but nevertheless connected to nature, connected to reality, that reflect the inner experience that your soul is designed to do. And this is the picture of the world that I want to leave you with. And it is the picture of the world that I think science is tending toward, and that's the argument I make in my book. I do think that this is how our consciousness also resolves the indeterminacy of, of particles into absolute position in time and space. This is why our experiments and our observations have an effect upon the what we're able to say about objects in the world, as well as about ideas and all the airy-fairy stuff. Even science itself needs this way of thinking in order to make sense of things, and it is a spiritual way of thinking. It doesn't look necessarily always like a spiritual way of thinking in that it doesn't come with all the smells and bells and the fancy whistles, but it is about the role of soul and the role of consciousness and the role of spirit in shaping matter and giving it its final form. And he says one last thing that I want to quote here because it's important and it goes back to that idea of the ring. You press your ring into the wax seal. The wax now takes on that form. It's going to go off and have its own form without matter or in a different matter. Just as your thoughts, once you've experienced a piano sonata or a cat or a tennis backhand or whatever, 
your thoughts can now carry that impression away with you and reason with it and think about it, but the piano is still there. The sonata is capable of being played again. All the stuff out there in the world can still affect you and can still affect other people just in the same way that the ring retains the carving that enabled it to make that impression in the wax. This is what Aquinas says next. Idem enim lumen quod intellectus recipit cum specie ab agente. So that light, and this is why my book is called Light of the Mind, Light of the World, that light which the intellect receives with the species, that is with the overarching idea under which it gathers its impressions, it receives it ab agente, from the agent, which is the thing outside, that thing that we can't make any direct contact with except through our senses and the symbolism of our senses in this broad sense, that thing is what gives us the idea that we then translate into our human language. Per actionum intellectus possibilis informati tali specie definitor. It's diffused through an action of potential understanding and remains with the object formed. Cum objectum formator et manet cum objecto formator. It was formed with the object itself and it remains with the object formed. That is, things are created with the potential to affect us in this way. And God makes them that way, but we are charged, tasked, privileged with bringing that potential into reality, into actuality. And that ring outside was carved before we were born. It was made without us. The, the carving in the ring, the world and the impressions it makes upon us are not ours to simply manipulate and transform, but it was they were made for our wax. They were made to impress into us, and that brings them to their final form, in just the same way that the stove is only burning in one more potentially sense until you put your hand on it, or better, don't put your hand on it, put a pot of chicken on it or something, and then it is burning, and then the water is receiving the heat. This, I hope, answers the question, what do I think about all of this in a nutshell? I think if you listen to these two episodes, you will get a clear picture of what I believe about translation, and basically also about everything else, which is not too bad for two 30-minute episodes. De Interpretatione, 16a, De Anima, 417, and round and about. De natura verbi intellectus, around chapter one, and really the whole thing. There's not great translations out there, I'm afraid. It's going to be thorny, philosophical going, but with hopefully with these episodes as your guide, they will be a light, let's say, a lumen naturale, an intellectus, a natural light of the intellect to guide you. Great questions. We're going to move on to some new topics next time, because I've spent a good chunk of time on this wonderful question. I have some more questions in the can. If you have questions, please keep them coming. I know I have a backlog, but I also love to think about them and stew on them. So if you send them to me now, you might not hear them answered for a while, but also it will be good for me to have them so that I can be noodling around, reading here and there, thinking a little bit about what, how I'm going to answer. The way to do that is to go to rejoiceevermore.substack.com, which is my weekly Substack. And there, once you become a subscriber, you can DM me your question, or you can just respond to my Friday essays, which will show up in your inbox, and you can reply with an email of your own. That's it from me this time. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.